Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University and it's a huge pleasure to awesome. moderate uh, this panel this afternoon. As many of you are aware, there's some 239 cities around the world that have been classified as fragile. And the task of governing those cities the task of trying to build companies in those cities, the task of trying to lead international efforts to help those cities often feels overwhelming. It feels overwhelming to all those different groups of people. This afternoon, we're going to show that it's not, that it doesn't need to be overwhelming, that one place we can start is to really think about what most needs doing instead of trying to think about everything that needs doing all at once. And we're very lucky today to have four panelists bringing four different perspectives on, on, on the issue. <coughs> on my far left is Minister Jitendra Singh, who's a minister in the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India, um, but who has had particular responsibility for the northeast of India, where last time I counted there are something in the range of 16 different insurgency movements and real uh, challenges to making that a governable space where investment can flourish. Um, coming along, one, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron, um, who is currently chairing a high-level commission on fragility and growth, which is being led by both my own institution, the Blavatnik School of Go Government at Oxford University, and the London School of Economics. And our former Prime Minister is just doing, if I might say, an amazing job of chairing a group of international thinkers and practitioners to really draw out lessons for fragile states. <coughs> and we'll hear more about that um, from David Cameron. And then moving along a further one, we have Basima Abdurrahman, who is an engineer trained in both Iraq and on a Fulbright scholarship in the United States who has actually been building a green energy company in Iraq, so in a fragile environment. Her company, Kesk, is now six months old, so I really look forward to hearing what have been the challenges and what are some of the things that are most important to get right if in fragile states and fragile cities we're going to encourage um, entrepreneurs and business people like Basima to, to build and invest. And Last and certainly not least, we are very honored to have here with us today the president of the Swiss Confederation, Alain Berset. And Dr. Berset, who has been an academic as well as a politician at the local level in the canton of Neuchâtel and Fribourg, so has a, a long experience in the public sector of <coughs> local democracy and inclusion and how you make that work. And it might seem a stretch to think that fragile cities around the world could learn from Switzerland. I know that once you've heard what uh, the president has to say, you'll see that there are some really deep lessons about inclusion and how inclusion can work um, and that could be um, thought about in fragile cities. So thank you for joining us for this conversation. I'm just before I um, invite Minister Jitendra Singh to kick us off. I'd just like to ask you, did any of you come here today with a burning question, with a question that you thought, right, I'm going to go to that session because I'd really like to know such and such. Any burning questions from you? Because there's no point coming up at five o'clock and saying you didn't touch on the one question I wanted <laughs> to see touched on. No, then I'd, I'll, I assure you I'm going to bring you in between, during, after speakers, so please have your you know, thinking caps on and be ready to participate. It's a lovely small room. We can make this an interactive conversation. Um, Minister Jitendra Singh, you've spent an extraordinary period of public service in the purpose of governing in the northeast of India. Could you share with us some of the things that those who are trying to make fragile cities work should not do, should avoid doing, if, if you like, mistakes that we can learn from, 
and some things and what you think, as it were, their one or two priorities should be. <coughs> Thank you. So at the outset, before I try to dwell on certain issues pertaining per se to northeast part of India, I think the 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 very definition of fragility is very fragile. And uh, to an extent, I uh, at least as I look at it, it's more of a relative term. May not be always static. <coughs> what is fragile today may not be so tomorrow, and what was it yesterday may not be so today. And I think it equally as much applies when you talk in the context of the fragile cities or fragile habitations. And uh, maybe some of the conventional factors that we usually tend to link as, as, as contributing to the fragility of a city or a habitation may not be absolute. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, There's a popular perception that maybe uh, uh, the larger cities or rapidly urbanizing places may be more fragile, but I'm not sure. Maybe the, the more faster developing cities could be more fragile regardless of their size. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether to have an absolute mathematical connection between the two. And uh, therefore, I think somewhere as the society evolves, I mean, some, there are certain issues which can't be left to government alone. And so also is this one. And the, the, the subject is too large to be left to only the government. And there may be a number of social angles to it, social aspects to it. And as the societies evolve, they learn to be more, be less vulnerable, less fragile, more stable. And in, in maybe in the societies which are in the process of evolving, and particularly in the context of Northeast, where we have a host of uh, heterogeneous factors. We have had insurgency for a long period of time, which now thankfully is uh, pretty much under control. And at least I can reasonably claim that in the last three, four years of the Modi government, there has been a tremendous change, uh, except for the occasional inc incidents of extortion or encounters. You don't have that kind of scenario where there are certain conflict zones um, persisting con continuously around the year. And uh, also the kind of prioritization which has been given, I think that's a very important aspect during the last three, four years in the present government, because this was a relatively a neglected area. Uh, for example, there were two of the states in this region called Meghalaya and Arunachal Pradesh, which had never seen a train. Now they are on the roadmap of the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was some uh, a different kind of prioritization which happened as a, uh, which could be uh, <coughs> partly the, the, the defining, de depending on the defining of the priorities by the political dispensation of that time or the administration of that time. So when there is backwardness, there is joblessness, and at the same time, there is also, the, the, there is, at least in India, there has always been consistently uh, a tendency to move from the rural to the urban areas for a variety of reasons, looking for greener pastures, looking for livelihood. But in situations like this, that, that that journey or that it, it assumes the form of an exodus. Mm -hmm. So you have a huge, huge youth exodus happening, you know, from one place to the other in search of a higher education, in search of livelihood, which could also uh, contribute to an unplanned situation, mm -hmm. which eventually sequentially could, you know, end up in fragility. But as I said in the beginning, I don't think it would be fair to call a fragile place a fragile because it doesn't, mm -hmm remain fragile all, mm -hmm. all the time. And Minister, can I ask you, you've mentioned bringing trains, so infrastructure um, in the Northeast. You've mentioned security and quelling the insurgency, and you've talked about jobs and urbanization. Are they, do you pursue all those three at once, or does one follow from the other? So, you know, given the challenge that I posed at the beginning, you can't, one of the things about if, if you're sitting in Syria or Iraq or, or Yemen, you, you certainly can't aim at doing more than one or two things. So where would you start? Which, how would you prioritize those? No, I get your point. They operate separately and also 
in a combination mm -hmm. and i'll tell you how because it it doesn't happen in isolation now for example if there is there is an urge to look for jobs which is contributing to the movement of the youth or the others mm -hmm. then maybe when you give a philip to the infrastructural development even you know if you are introducing a, a train into a region you are laying rail tracks and mm -hmm. you are in fact generating revenue you are generating jobs so mm -hmm. all the things happen as an ancillary similarly if you do not have enough of connectivity mm -hmm. that comes in the way of a lot much of entrepreneurship or the young startup initiatives and the uh, which would otherwise be expected to be coming up there would then start looking for other places mm -hmm. uh, similarly if if you have uh, not enough of resources to actually exploit the potentials i'll just mm -hmm. exemplify that with a small instance for example in northeast we have about 40% of fruit just lying on the streets in the roads mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it goes waste because all these years there's not been enough of uh, <coughs> provision to give the to to have a proper storage or proper transportation mm -hmm. now if if they if we had something like that mm -hmm. you could actually generate a food industry at a much cost effective <coughs> budget mm -hmm. with with a host of other you know uh, gainful consequences mm -hmm. and of course the present government is trying to now address all those issues but what i'm trying to say is that all these factors then tend to unite mm -hmm. in producing a cumulative effect mm -hmm. in one way or the other mm -hmm. maybe at different times mm -hmm. or maybe later or sometimes sooner sooner thank, than later thank you so much uh, basima abdurrahman so minister jitendra singh has highlighted for us you know infrastructure connectivity finance resources security as necessary for trying to build and trying to govern as well but you've been building a business in Iraq which is quite short on some of those things um can you tell us what what for you in order to build your green energy business what have been the most essential things from all of that list is it the whole list or is it something else so for me for example um if we're thinking of only one aspect only rebuilding without taking into consideration the safety security people government readiness <coughs> yeah um it's not possible but we've been going through the crisis there has been a lot of destruction because of the military operation um the the amount of destruction is so high so we have cities that have 80% um for in Mosul exact, to be exact at the west of Mosul we have 80% amount of damaged buildings so we are going to rebuild we are going to reconstruct these cities mm -hmm. my business is about rebuilding right mm -hmm. so we are in this phase so i need to make sure that we are incorporating sustainability in rebuilding and reconstruction mm -hmm. because we are not rebuilding for for our current population we are rebuilding for a future generations mm -hmm. for us in the future we need to think we need to be uh, visionaries mm -hmm. uh, futuristic in design and construction but at the same time we need to make sure that our solutions are applicable and and the government and the people are ready for for this type of of change and do you, do you, but do you come across people who say look green energy is a luxury that iraq can't afford at the moment it so desperately needs energy we should use whatever energy we can get our hands on so i get this a lot mm -hmm. um i hear uh, the exact phrase that there are people dying mm -hmm. nobody cares about the environment mm -hmm. um when i go and approach i i try not to talk about environment als although environment protection is my passion mm -hmm. i try to talk much about the economic value of building green mm -hmm. because when we when we are building green we are saving we are saving energy we are saving water we are saving environment so we are we are building to make sure that social economical mm -hmm. 
and, and um, environmental factors all incorporated when we talk about green buildings. So this is usually my approach, is about the, the financial and, and the economical aspect of it. And has there been, have outsiders helped you do that? Outsiders by providing finance, ideas, support, a push on the, on the government, or, or not? Um, what do you mean by outside? Outsiders, other governments, international organizations, well, it's private been, investors from outside Iraq. Um, it's been, so far, just individual effort mm -hmm. by myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been using um, um, knowledge and experience from the United States, especially the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, they have uh, a, a, um, a significant rating system for green buildings. Um, it's uh, it's very efficient. is is very very common. It's applicable all over uh, the world. So it's flexible design. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is something I would love to incorporate while doing design and construction in, in my country. Thank you very much. If I can turn now to uh, David Cameron, who is chairing the High Level Commission on Fragility, Growth and Development. Um, You've been collecting, thinking about distilling the lessons. Where, where would you start? Well, I think the first point um, is you can't separate out fragile cities from fragile states. You're very unlikely to have a truly stable city within a otherwise um, <coughs> fragile state uh, or vice versa. So I think that the key thing is to, and I agree with my panelists, they're, they're relative terms, but I think we all know what the makeup of a fragile state or a fragile city is. It's one that is riven with corruption, that has uh, debt problems of conflict, that has a very weak capacity, is unable to deliver the key services that people want. It's often one, a city or a country, where the authorities are seen as lacking legitimacy, so people don't trust and uh, believe in them. Uh, there's the chance of chronic failure. Um, due to internal, external factors. They tend not to be very resilient. So we know what a, a fragile state looks like and why we think this commission is so important, just to give it the one-second advert, is, is soon 50% of the world's poor will be living in fragile states because, by and large, India, with its economic success, and China, with its economic success, are lifting their own poor uh, out of poverty and will be left with 50% of the world's poor in countries like uh, Bangladesh or... Um, Zimbabwe or, or, or Bangladesh or, or, or wherever. So this is, is incredibly important. And it's also very difficult because, of course, if the challenge is how do we tackle disease, well, you pay for a vaccination program. If the challenge is how do we educate more uh, children, you build more schools. But this is much more difficult. It's harder to build a legitimate tax authority um, than it is to vaccinate a child or, or build a school. So it is very, very tough. But I think the focus, second point, the focus on cities is good because urbanization is a vital part of development. It is one of the things that drives development. It's where the miracle of specialization and productivity takes, takes place. And here's a statistic for you, which, which sort of made me realize how important this is, is if you take Africa, between now and 2050, we're going to see another two-thirds of urbanization. So put another way around, two-thirds of Africa's cities haven't been built yet. They will be built in the next um, 30 years. So there's an enormous opportunity to get it right um, or get it wrong. When it comes to getting it right, I think the answer we are coming up with, specifically for cities, is the absolutely bleeding obvious one, which is its infrastructure. But when we say its infrastructure, it isn't just the physical infrastructure of the roads, the railways. Um, it, it is actually the legal infrastructure. One of the biggest problems for cities in developing countries and fragile states is actually the lack of a legal infrastructure, the lack of a property registry. Nobody knows who owns what. You know, if you go to some cities in Africa, you see signs saying, this house is not for sale. And the reason that sign is there is people are worried that someone else is going to come along, claim their house, and sell it. <coughs> so one of the most important bits of infrastructure you can put in place is a legal registry. I think if the other point I think we'll be looking at is when we look at infrastructure, there's a tendency to think big, whereas actually some of the most important infrastructure is actually, you know, the roads, the sewage capacity, the, 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 the you know, the really basic stuff. Um, and uh, I, I suppose, anyway, but I think infrastructure will be the biggest answer we come up with in terms of how to um, make cities less fragile. And that leads to a, a fourth point, which is 
um, absolutely crucial, which is the sustainability of that infrastructure. And I don't mean here in a green sense. Obviously, it's good if we do build green infrastructure. I mean sustainability is in, as in, can it be paid for and can it be um, upgraded? And here, it, it leads to, I think, a really uh, important conclusion, um, which is one of the most important things in helping to tackle fragility, is tax and having a buoyant and working tax system. And cities ought to have an advantage here because, of course, as a city grows, the property values and the land values tend to go up. And so it should be possible for city <coughs> authorities to put in place tax um, ways of capturing some of that benefit, whether through a rating system or land value taxation or whatever it is. Um, but that's absolutely crucial. So when we're thinking of how do we help other countries and how do we help cities be successful, thinking of the sustainability of the tax revenue that city will have in order to provide the services is, is going to be absolutely vital. And that leads me to my final point, and I promise I'll shut up, which is, see, what the Commission is thinking about is how should this change the debate about aid? How should it change the debate about how um, better off Western countries seek to assist uh, developing countries? Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of changes need to be made there because obviously look, I'm a very proud of the fact that as Prime Minister I got 0.7% of gross national income, Britain, the only G7 country to do it, although all the others have promised. Let me just make that point. No good to put it on the record. <laughs> um, uh, it's not just about money. I mean, it is going to, you know, in a way, I think there are a whole series of conclusions that we will come to, uh, giving security a greater priority, um, giving infrastructure a greater priority. But crucially, I think a lot of it is about how we help. And often the way we help is we do things to other cities and other countries rather than with them. And if the crucial determinant of the success of a city is a sense that um, the people who live in it um, think that the city authorities are trustworthy and legitimate and can deliver public services and therefore it's right to pay your taxes and all the rest of it. That is absolutely crucial. We won't do that if, if the way we act as Western countries is often undermining the legitimacy and the capacity of the very countries we're trying to help. So uh, long way of saying we need to make sure as we try and help other countries, we are helping them to deliver rather than delivering for them. And I think that will be a very big theme of, of, uh, of the work we um, do. But I, I think tax and infrastructure and sustainability of developing a city is going to be absolutely crucial to, to um, the difference between... And there are plenty of examples of successful, unfragile cities and ones that are deeply fragile, and I think those will be the key components. Excellent. And I think in our discussion, <coughs> let's come back to what feels like a little bit of a gap between your starting definition of fragile states riven with corruption, whose governments have lost legitimacy, and as it were, the solution, infrastructure, tax. Does that solve the problems of corruption and lack of legitimacy, or do we have to do these separately? But that's just hold, let's yeah. hold that thought and come back to that in discussion. Because your last point leads us beautifully to uh, President Berset. Um, David Cameron has said, we've got to think about how we help. We've got to think about how it is put another way, that communities need to do the doing themselves. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world where there is a reaction against outsiders, experts, you know, high up governments coming in and imposing their will on communities. And Switzerland is always held up as the example of where local democracy works. <coughs> so share with us both some examples of the, the smallest levels at which we can even think about inclusion, and then what are the challenges of it? You know, if you were trying to uh, apply the lessons that you learnt sitting in the constitutional court of, mm -hmm. of Fribourg or of uh, Neuchâtel to a fragile environment, you know, what are, what are some of the lessons that you might try and draw from it? Well, thank you. First of all, I must say, I'm sure I'm not the the best person to speak about fragile cities because we do not have <coughs> cities in Switzerland described, described as fragile. We have a lot of cities described as being boring, <laughs> but this is another debate. It means I'm not able to, uh, to tell you what, what is to do. I maybe can just highlight how it works in Switzerland. And it is so we had, uh, we've made 
very good experiences uh, in the cities. Well, in the majority small cities, it is also not to compare with big cities. And uh, we have a very long tradition of direct democracy, of uh, participation, of uh, consultation, and that allows to, when, when we mix the, 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 the size of the cities, mm -hmm. well, our biggest agglomeration in Switzerland is Zurich with one million people, very small. Uh, with the size of the cities, when we see the mix between this side of cities and the direct democracy, it allows to have a strong participation of the people. And uh, it includes the services, schooling, for example, where the people can decide on the local level, on the city level, how is it to organize it. It could also uh, be for the infrastructure, road construction, for example, uh, or also for, uh, for the taxes, tax rates. And it makes real a very strong inclusion but how the does that people how feel really, really you, you mentioned to me getting you know getting children involved in the design of their own community playground but how does that work because in practice you've got you know child psychologists engineers of playgrounds consultants galore you know the experts say look this is how you can design a playground and this is where you should build it and this is how it can be cost efficient so how do you carve out the space to to do this it it, it it sounds lovely, but how practically do you make that work? Very concrete, very easy. Meeting people, mm -hmm. connecting people together. Mm -hmm. I think with the direct democracy, you have uh, on, only one thing is, is sure. Mm -hmm. At the end of the process, you have a popular vote. Mm -hmm. And you have to find a majority mm -hmm. to make an investment, to organize a place, to organize a school, mm -hmm. to, to, to build a school or a road. Mm -hmm. You need a majority. Mm -hmm. And if you are looking for a majority since the beginning of the work. Mm. You must try to uh, take the people with you uh, mm. since the beginning. Mm. And uh, well, is it, it is not so complicated to organize. Uh, it is possible to organize in the cities maybe with uh, associations, mm. with um, support, um, public support for neighborhood associations, mm. or maybe uh, with um, um, well, associations of, uh, um, not of children, but of parents mm. to, to discuss with, very easy. And I, m I must say, it very s important thing is the size of our cities that allows really mm. those contacts. Because mm -hmm. you say direct democracy, there's such a difference for anyone in the room that spent time in California and that spent time in Switzerland, that in both places there are, there are plebiscites in one, it's every four years where you suddenly hit with 51 balloted issues, some of which are unusual to say the least in California, and suddenly a whole population who, don't, who are not otherwise consulted have to vote. Mm -hmm. And that's not how it's working in Switzerland. And I, I think the, the, the contrast between this established system of ongoing consultation and inclusion, mm -hmm. which leads to a vote being meaningful <coughs> is rather important. I think it, it is also related in Switzerland, and maybe the difference with a very big state like California. California is, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, eight, eight times bigger than Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And uh, a strong thing in Switzerland is also the federalism, this, this strong decentralization. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, well, I, I live in a village since 40 years, more than 40 years with my family. 3,000 3, people living there. I, I know personally each, each of them. <coughs> and uh, when we have to choose something for, for the village, we meet. Mm -hmm. There is a meeting, uh, uh, how is the name in, in English? There is a, uh, an assembly mm -hmm. where the citizen can go, mm -hmm. they can mm -hmm. say something mm -hmm. and, and, and take a decision. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And I think it, it's th those direct contacts between people is really a strong thing, mm -hmm. but it, it is not to, to export, I think. It's not so easy to export. But, but surely mm -hmm. there's, uh, I mean, it's quite difficult to compare a city of a million with a Mexico City or a Lagos or a, one of these mega cities. But surely the, the common factor is that you're looking for 
is you need a narrative that people will buy into about being prepared to give up some current benefits for future benefits. Because cities only work if you're prepared to pay your taxes, build infrastructure, invest in the, you know, you have to, you have, to have that. And the point about, I mean, I'm no expert on Switzerland, but it seems to me there's a remarkable consensus in Switzerland about the sort of national story, about mm -hmm. who you are and what you want to do and the sort of cities and communities you want to build. And uh, so direct democracy works very, very well in that context. But the, the shared narrative is already there. Mm -hmm. And so in, in fragile cities, in countries that are growing very fast, what we've got to try and do, as well as build this infrastructure and whatever, is, is try and help them to get to a situation where people are prepared, yes, to you know, give up some current benefits for the future benefit of having a more successful, more stable um, city. And that's where the, the Swiss example maybe has some, some relevance. When it is growing very fast, I think the, the main problem is to, um, to contain the risk to uh, uh, have a rise of inequalities. That's a big problem, I think. And it's also an advantage for Switzerland. We are not growing so fast in our cities but, and villages. But you know? I, I would challenge that a bit. I mean, it seems to me that part of our problem in trying to work out how to help the most fragile countries, the most fragile cities, is we've had a, we haven't had enough of a sense of priorities. And uh, I think you know, the biggest priority of all is security. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you take very unstable situations, like perhaps you know, recently in, in um, parts of Iraq or, or Syria, or, you know, just knowing you're going to wake up and still be alive in the morning. I mean, security is the number one. And you know, I think sometimes when the West thinks about how we help other countries, we mm -hmm. you know, design the perfect strategy for tackling inequality. But actually, the first thing you need is security. <laughs> so the first thing is security. The second thing is, is economic activity. And I think sometimes we get our priorities wrong. Well, and as we do this work on how we help fragile states, I think we're going to have to be very hard-headed, very practical mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. things that matter the most. Mm -hmm. The West often thinks, well, what we need is a roadmap towards early elections. And in many cases, that is a disastrous idea. I'm all in favor of democracy. Don't get me wrong. But what matters more than the fact of holding the election is making sure um, that you've got the building blocks of democracy. You've got the rule of law. You've got certain rights and uh, all the rest. Can of it. I when the election comes about, <coughs> that there's a sort of shared understanding that it's not a winner takes all. It's not one man, one vote once, as it were. So I think it's, it's about getting the priorities right. And I think if we say inequality is the top priority, I think we've been missing the point. Minister Jitendra Singh, just on this issue of putting security first, um, I recall the United Nations UNOPS doing a survey in Afghanistan two years into the war in Afghanistan. And to their surprise, Citizens did not put security number one. They put number one, their children being able to go to school. Yeah. And, and, and I thought that was very interesting and thought provoking. But what's your experience? Would you put security first? I, I, I'm glad you raised this issue. But uh, if you permit me before coming to mm. that, I'll just try to pick up, uh, pick on from where the discussion was going on. Uh, from I, I'll try to put across a different perspective. Uh, I, I think the prioritization is also fragile. And I'll just try to explain how. Looking at a so-called fragile city from Swiss perspective may draw different inferences compared to looking at a Swiss so-called fragile city in Switzerland from an Indian perspective. <laughs> and I think uh, the, the it's not easy to quantify it, but for example, the entire population of Switzerland is just about 8 million, if I'm not wrong, which is less than the population of a city called Delhi. Mm -hmm. So I think that about sums up the whole thing. So in a way, at least as far as India is concerned, now for example, this is this is a absolutely a heterogeneous <coughs> nation or a, or a collection of several sub-nationalities. That's why for generations together it has been referred to as Indian subcontinent. So I think it's unfair to compare the two and draw certain inferences because the inferences can't, can't be uniform. But, that is so, one, but one of, I now, think, now, the now, president's... Now, 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 let's come. No, but sorry, just on size, though, one of the president's <coughs> points, I think, is that the smaller the community that you're governing, the easier it is to include people 
And is that not your experience in India? See, it absolutely. Seems that you've See, I'll, I'll tell you. No, it's a very relevant point, and the president also put it very nicely. Ideally, that should is what how it should happen. Now, in a village of three thousand, he is able to get in touch with everybody, and rightly mm -hmm. so. And that is what is the essence of a ideal democracy. In India, we have to actually slog to form this kind of a citizen contact. Though, ideally, that is what is expected, and and in, in today's days and time, the citizen part participation. Is the essence of democracy. You have to be. You have to have a, uh, an arrangement which is absolutely transparent, absolutely accountable, and 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 it can't happen without the participation of the citizen. Mm -hmm. And to to have the participation of uh, of a population which is as much as you know 1.3 billion or whatever is not easy. So our representatives also have to slog day and night. By the time now the president grew up in that village which was 3,000 population, right from his fourth standard, as he said. Now, I too grew up from a village. When I go back to my village, it's no longer the same village which I left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the entire the, 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 the pace, as I said, the prioritization is also very fragile from place to place because the world is such a fascinating thing to live in. And uh, having said that, the other part which I was uh, looking at is that although the Modi government has launched on a very ambitious uh, plan of uh, bringing up smart cities, but I think that definition also will crystallize over a period of time because smart cities, of course, will essentially have a good smart infrastructure, but then smart citizens as well. And the smart citizens means the citizen who can contribute to the, to the, to the, to the successful uh, conduct of a democracy as the uh, president was uh, pointing out. Uh, as far as uh, uh, two things, as far as uh, the inequality, in developing, I, just as a brief point, what the president said, of course, that's to be taken care of. Maybe that is more relevant, and of course, relevant elsewhere also, but that's the only inequality that is to be taken care of in the context of the Swiss uh, milieu. At my place, the inequalities pre exist even before the development starts. Now, for example, you refer to Northeast. Now, I'm dealing with um, eight states in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Even in a single given state, if you take the instance of a state called Manipur, which is a small state, you have some of the districts which are placed on the hills, others placed on the valleys. There's so much of topographical difficulty, so much of uh, challenges which are inherent to those places. To ensure the equitable development itself is a challenge within one place to other. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not easy to draw a parallel, but I agree with you when you try to supplement Mr. Cameron's uh, suggestion about the security with the urge to have uh, uh, good education for children, good health. I think that is the basic. And I think the fragility, as though I would agree with, the, with Mr. Cameron as far as the state fragility leading on to add to the fragility of a state, because of course state is ultimately responsible for uh, keeping everything non-fragile including the cities. But the aspiration itself adds to fragility. Mm -hmm. If all the other factors are held uniformly, the state is ideal, the place is ideal, the city is ideal, the growth is ideal, the growth is equal, there is no inequality, aspirations would differ. Now she's working on a startup thing. Mm -hmm. She has a huge range of aspiration working inside her. I have another range of it. So that in a pop given population, mm -hmm. that also adds to the more aspirational a given society, uh, the more you have to address, be awakened to that kind of a situation also. So I think Thank that you. also, to a great extent, ultimately would fall into the responsibility of the state as well. Yeah. But that also can't be missed out. That's what I'm trying to say. So thank you. So there's been a rich array of um, issues put on the table, inequality, corruption, environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, inclusiveness, you know, good decision-making structures, are these all luxuries you know, for a fragile state? So I know we've got students that go from the School of Government back to their own countries, Syria, Yemen, both strike to mind, who say that the minute they go back to take leading roles in government, they're simply overwhelmed by the demands of helping outsiders, helping international organizations, helping NGOs, helping who have a list of aspirations a mile long, and, and, it, and it drowns them. So there's a... There's a trade-off here, isn't there? Now, wh what are your questions to our panelists? Are any of you gonna vote for one of these coming right to the top of the agenda? 
Rajiv Lal heads India's Infrastructure Investment Bank. So I'm going to predict where you're going to come out on priorities, and it's going to begin with infrastructure. No, it's not actually, ah. um, because actually one of the learnings uh, in infrastructure, even in India, is, uh, is precisely this. A fortiori in fragile cities and states, it starts with state capacity. Mm. If you don't address state capacity first, nothing else matters. Mm. You can dream about infrastructure, you can dream about improving your tax systems, <laughs> you can dream about giving good public education. Mm -hmm. If you don't have basic mm -hmm. state capacity, mm -hmm. it's a problem. Even in a country like India, mm -hmm. at a municipal level, administrative capacity is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I mean, and we've looked at the range of these issues over the years, no matter which way you cut it, you come back to this fundamental issue, and nobody is talking about what we need to do to build state capacity. I, I completely agree with that. I mean, that is, I mean, what we're finding in our commission work is these interrelated things of the lack of state legitimacy, the lack of state capacity, problems of conflict, problems of corruption, they're all interrelated to each other. No, I think, but I think I, you're I, absolutely I right. I think you summed up that very beautifully when you said the state fragility mm -hmm. is something that is to be guarded against. You, but but this, this, this point, I think he's right, that if we look at a fragile state or a fragile city and just simply think that needs some infrastructure and just sort of plonk the infrastructure in, mm -hmm. that will help in one way, there's a bit of infrastructure, mm -hmm. But often it will be done in a way that totally undermines the authorities that are there. And if the fundamental problem is that the authorities aren't seen as legitimate enough and they're not actually capable enough, you haven't solved the problem. And so this is why it's much harder because it's, as I said, it's much harder to build a legitimate tax collecting authority than it is to build a school. But nonetheless, if you don't have the first, you'll never in the end sustainably get the second. Let me and so I think we need to change the whole focus of the way we do aid and development and assistance to try and back the, the capacity point. I mean, a, as a former prime minister, right. I can tell you, even in a highly developed country, you often feel as prime minister, you pull a lever and you find there's absolutely nothing connected to that lever and uh, the thing you thought was going to happen doesn't. That often happens too. I'd just like to bring in, thank you, uh, from Peter Pio, another perspective, because as a global health person, who has dealt with Ebola, who is doubtless watching cholera epidemics, et cetera, in fragile cities around the world. What would you put as your top priority, Peter Pio? Uh, thanks, um, Gary. I, I'm always looking for opportunities. And uh, even in, uh, let's say, fragile situations, and uh, I've lived myself in, in DRC, for example, in Congo, where the state is basically uh, as absent. Um, and I'm always impressed by the creativity um, of citizens to survive. They find solutions that we may not think of. And so um, I don't have a uh, top priority. I would say infrastructure definitely from a health perspective, water sanitation and all that services. But I think, you know, Try to nurture the creativity, the inventiveness. I mean, you go to places in like cities in Nigeria and, and they, or in India, you know, people have found ways that we may not have thought of. And so my uh, small priority would be talk to people, listen to them, and they may come up with some things. Um, but it's the sustainability of all this that is always a, a, a big issue. That very much reinforces uh, President Berset's point. Other, other, other questions, comments. On what oh, uh, could, I, could I just add to what mm. uh, was being mentioned in the context of global health? Actually, I think <coughs> the, the, the the disease spectrum is so variable from one part of the world to the other part that uh, fragility on account of sanitation or poor sanitation may be a factor in one part of the world. Mm -hmm may not be in other parts of the world where much of the morbidity may be happening in spite of the best of the best sanitations. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, it's, it's such a simplistic mm -hmm. understanding of it at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to call on Andre Hoffman who's sitting there because Andre, you're an eloquent exponent of the case for sustainability. But what would your response be to people in Syria or Iraq or, or Afghanistan who say, we can't afford that luxury. 
When you talk about luxury, you talk about green infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think green infrastructure I is not a question of luxury. It really is a question of long-term sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'm sure we, we addressed that a little bit earlier before, but I do strongly believe that if you do have the opportunity to build infrastructure, mm -hmm. just doing it quickly in order to cover the needs immediately and seeing it going obsolete in a matter of years is, is not serving the purpose at all. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of can you afford it. It's a question how long do you want it to be efficient, how long do you want it to help the community which are going to rely on. And I think that's what you were saying before. Yeah, very much echoes what you were saying, Basima. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a scale issue though, isn't there? Sometimes, um, you know, Western aid agencies or financial institutions will want to try and propose a sort of massive uh, sustainable scheme, whereas what might actually work better is small scale solar and batteries and lights that actually work with the grain of what people want. And, one of the things we found in our uh, commission's work is so often uh, we make the best the enemy of the good. I mean, actually, we had a great bit of evidence from uh, a Yemeni politician who said it was exactly at the moment when in the parliament in, in Yemen they were writing the absolutely perfect natural resources law and how natural resources are going to... And it was at the moment they just finished the work that the Houthis arrived in the capital and the whole place um, collapsed. And it was a sort of brought home to us the importance of... You know, security comes first. You can't make every country end up like Denmark. Try and work with what you've got and try to improve the situation you have. And and rather than trying to aim for perfection, uh, I know it's rather a sort of downbeat thing to say at Davos, but the more we've looked at examples of what works and what doesn't, the more we've found that so many of the outside interventions have had totally unrealistic expectations um, and have not only undermined the capacity and the legitimacy of the authorities they're trying to help, um, but actually being done on a scale and in a way that, that, that simply doesn't work. So David Cameron's mentioned legitimacy and corruption a number of times. How many of you think that fighting corruption should be a key priority in trying to rebuild a fragile city? Or trying to make, how many? So, and how many think not? Oh, no, there's too many people in the room not thinking. Let's do it again. Stretch. Come on, get your brain going. So how many of you think corruption should be a priority? And how many think that it, it, it's important but not necessarily a priority? Okay, so... Because a lot of the academic work we find sort of treats corruption as a sort of natural byproduct of mm. other problems mm. rather than, as the audience would seem to suggest, see this is an absolutely <laughs> crucial problem. Uh, and one of the things we found, when we, we did the, um, the panel on how to replace the Millennium Development Goals, we did some research on what people most cared about. And of course, material poverty in, in the developing world came first, but very close on its heels. That second was justice, was the sense that people are being robbed by corrupt authorities, don't have access to justice. And I, I think that the academic community can sometimes make a mistake of not realizing just how important, what a burning injustice people feel about the corruption that they experience in their everyday lives? I, I think from the perspective of lots of fragile states, it's not actually on a kind of moral issue. It's that some of the intensely complicated procurement policies that they're asked to adopt in order to avoid corruption simply overwhelm them. Uh, could I add to just what uh, David Cameron was saying? Uh, and I also, to, to in fact, endorse your point to an extent, Corruption um, should not be actually, it may not be right to view it purely from a moralistic point of view. In, in, in a highly corruption-ridden states, there's a huge amount of pilferage mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of exchequer happening. Mm -hmm. So leave aside the moral aspect of it. Mm -hmm. There's also a huge, huge loss happening, mm -hmm. both of the taxpayers' money as well as the state exchequer, mm -hmm. which could otherwise be gainfully utilized mm -hmm. in the building of a non-fragile uh, uh, habitation. So I think mm -hmm. that also is what requires to be considered. Mm -hmm. Other perspectives from the room? Yes, at the back. Uh, Do introduce yourself. Uh, sorry. My name is Esteban Bullrich. I used to be Minister of Education in Argentina, and now I'm a senator in, in Argentina. Uh, I wanted to bring up social capital. I think building trust within those fragile communities through education and training is as important. We've, we've seen it we, we have 30% poverty level in Argentina, and uh, we are doing a huge investment in infrastructure. But I think if, if we go to those fragile communities and don't help them build trust among themselves, 
So to develop their own social mm -hmm. capital, uh, it, that will help strengthen the, the local authorities, strengthen the community itself, getting everyone involved, business, uh, local uh, judicial officials, mm -hmm. government officials, to really help in getting that community to be a sustainable one after you leave. Because mm -hmm. then the infrastructure will mm -hmm. be able to be redeveloped by that same community and without the help of external forces. So I wanted to bring up the education factor, not only mm -hmm. at the basic level of, of uh, uh, primary and secondary, but also at retraining of the workforce in, in the community and, and giving new abilities and skills to the community. Um, one moment, Senator. Um, how do you build that trust? I think last year at Davos, there was some of the mayor's team from Buenos Aires who were talking about involving locals. And what was interesting is when they first tried to involve citizens in big issues, they got very little engagement. And they spoke about a, a project about the zoo, closing the zoo, as I recall. Yeah. Um, I recall that one of the big problems was once they all agreed to close the zoo, they had to try and work out what to do with the elephants and giraffes, which you can't ship very easily. But that was a, sorry, that's a side <laughs> issue. But, but, but it was the difference between taking very local issues to engage people and taking big national issues. Yeah, and sometimes when, when we talk about infrastructure and uh, community development or getting out of fragile communities, we turn to only look at governments mm -hmm. or, or, or public officials. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to do, and I have some business representatives from Argentina here that are working mm -hmm. in, in that kind of project, is getting the uh, private sector involved in that mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. of the community. Mm -hmm. Because then you can work together in looking what are the different avenues of growth and what are the skills and abilities needed. And then the infrastructure also works towards that, that goal. But can you give us an example of something that actually built trust? Yeah, well, uh, for example, in we, we started working in uh, Ashanti town, the south of the city, mm -hmm. with a, a local uh, uh, company there in developing skills that that company needed mm -hmm. uh, and opening up the relation between the private sector and the community itself, mm -hmm. which was not there. Because of mm -hmm. the fragility of the community, the mm -hmm. trust is not there. Mm -hmm. So you need to rebuild trust. And it's not only with the government officials that mm -hmm. come to the, to the place with the infrastructure and compromising mm -hmm. and, and uh, corruption is an issue, but also mm -hmm. the fact that uh, several times deadlines are not accomplished. Mm -hmm. So that's also a way of building trust with the local officials. But then showing that that infrastructure will also bring mm -hmm. private sector involvement mm -hmm. and then the community strengthens. And so trust is not only built there, mm -hmm. but also with, with the community. And the private sector can also help mm -hmm. in developing local mm -hmm. associations within the community. Mm -hmm. So cooperatives, that is a, a form that is being exploited in Argentina quite mm -hmm. a bit, uh, making sure that the community knows how to work together business sense is not built in the, mm -hmm. uh, into those communities usually mm -hmm. because the education system failed. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, we, we're not giving them fish anymore. We mm -hmm. taught them how to fish, mm -hmm. but we didn't tell them what to do with the fish mm -hmm. they catch. Sure. <laughs> you know? So now we're telling them how they can elaborate mm -hmm. social capital and financial capital and economical capital from mm -hmm. that ability that they gain through mm -hmm. a welfare program. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Berset, is there a relationship between in Switzerland with this intense local consultation. Is there a difference? Is there a sort of spectrum where if you're consulting on something local to the community, you give them complete control? If you're consulting on something national like immigration policy, you leave yourself open to take a decision yeah. the opposite way. Is there a sort of sense that, <laughs> that locals have the highest rights to decide when it's a really local issue? Well, it's, it's quite a complicated question. I can say maybe it is uh, possible to, to find good solutions at local level because on the local level, when you decide something, mm -hmm. um, it has consequences for your life personally. Mm -hmm. On the national level, it is possible to, uh, well, to take a decision without to feel mm -hmm. the consequences of the decision. Mm -hmm. and it could be, it can be more difficult. And we had in that sense, in the last years, uh, well, several quite com complicated uh, popular votes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that on the, at the local level, it's very a good, mm -hmm. good place to, to make mm -hmm. these consultations mm -hmm. and this work. You decide, you decide how to, mm -hmm. to finance the, what you decide, mm -hmm. 
and you feel after that the consequences for mm -hmm. what, what, what you decided. Mm -hmm. I think that's very concrete, mm -hmm. very concrete. And I think Peter Pio's intervention highlights how that can work even in some of the poorest, most fragile communities where people are forced to be more creative in order to survive and that we need more trust of those communities to use that creativity. You had a comment, sir. Yeah, yeah I, actually I have a question if, if yes. possible. My name is Saeed from United Arab Emirates. Uh, and my question is, what is the relationship between the fragile cities and fragile governments or fragile mm -hmm. countries? Uh, because most, most of the priorities uh, listed by the, by, by the respected panel is about you know, uh, security and safety, rule of law and justice system, education and, and all of these issues are usually controlled by these, the government, mm -hmm. the, the, the country itself, not by the cities. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 if all of the solutions are in, in, the, in, the, in the federal government or in the government hand, or the state mm -hmm. government hand, what, what, are the role, what are the role of these cities? I mean, and if we take like uh, an example of, of China where, where, the, where the, the, the central government is very strong, where they have put in a place a very strong education system and a very strong infrastructure and a very strong, and then the cities come with their other uh, priorities. My question is, if all the priorities for fragile cities are controlled by the fragile governments, why mm -hmm. aren't, aren't we are talking about the governments, mm -hmm. not the cities themselves? Well, really Great, important. I'm gonna hold that, take two more questions, then come and give each that. panelist a chance mm -hmm. to leave us with one takeaway thought. Mm -hmm. So there was another, yeah, here. New age, but what is state of optimism and pessimism? I mean, right? Is it? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I mean, I think there, I about you can you can definitely say that there are some places, some cities that are, are very optimistic, mm -hmm. no matter what the present mm -hmm. situation is. Oh, I see. Right. So um, morale is really important. Morale and aspiration. I think that, this was that, mentioned. That itself is a relative comparison. <laughs> what is optimism for him may be pessimism for me. Yes. So I think but I think he's echoing, Minister, your point yes, earlier exactly. that the level it's of aspiration absolutely. is I very important. I think the, the theory of relativity is yep. ultimately the one crux more, of the entire discussion. One more question from over here, and then I'm going to come to each panelist. Um, <clears throat> hi, sorry. I, I, more have, um, I have a comment rather than a question. <laughs> Great. Um, in my line of work, I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, so mm -hmm. mostly in fragile environments where we feel every time we propose like a big urban project, the citizens would tell us we'd need individual boreholes, mm -hmm. individuals. Uh, we feel more and more that public property has no value anymore in fragile environments where everything is turned mm -hmm. for survival, basically. Mm -hmm. I spent mm -hmm. five years in Iraq and I totally agree with what you said, where again, public property has no sense. And mm -hmm. I yeah. think, what uh, Senator Esteban just said links back to bringing back citizenship <laughs> to enable states, in, enable basically state capacities mm -hmm. to grow. Otherwise, you know, there's no basis, there's nothing to build upon mm -hmm. because again, the fragility of the war, the violence has mm -hmm. disrupted all of that negatively. So there was only a comment rather than a question. Thank you. So a tension that's run through this panel is between big solutions that might be efficient, that might be technically sound, and local solutions, small solutions, which people are demanding, your local communities that each want a borehole because they think that's what they can protect and that's gonna help save their lives, or the local locals that President Berset mentioned, right, who want control over the things they, that really affect their lives. So we've had this kind of tension between local solutions empowering communities to make those, and bigger solutions where how do you rebuild Syria, Iraq, Yemen with, is it through very small, individually, borehole by borehole, community by community, or is it with a national plan? So I'm gonna let each of our panelists leave you with one takeaway thought. We have <coughs> 30 seconds, that gives them about 10 seconds each. So Minister J Jitendra Singh, what would your takeaway thought for the uh, audience the be? I think the crux of the discussion is that as, as, as the world shrinks, it's becoming a global world, and notwithstanding all our heterogeneous cities and uh, other factors, 
the world would ultimately be looking forward to a new infrastructure roadmap with certain globally defined mm -hmm. uh, and and as far as possible uniform parameters taking to cognizance all the concerns and i guess the citizen participation at all level not only at the local level or the, the, the at a larger level mm -hmm. is essential not only because of the physical participation part of it but also because of the satisfaction that it gives to the local citizen of being a participant which might take care of a lot much of grievance which might otherwise arise mm -hmm. uh, it, to confront with the state and therefore the citizen himself would also be responsible for taking care of lot much of its grievance mm -hmm. and as we head for a global democratically governed ideal state i think we would actually have to work for that mm -hmm. which of course as david cameron said would also take care of a corruption free governance which would ultimately happen because the citizen participation the more and more it happens would not allow that to happen because the two are not compatible with each other thank you very much minister I think david the, cameron the boreholes is the key I mean, why do people want individual boreholes not public works because there's a lack of trust why is there a lack of trust because there's a lack of capacity in government and a lack of leadership uh, a lack of good leadership and a lack of a shared narrative that people can buy into about what the leaders are doing, what the country is doing. And in the end, I think the more work we do on this, it does come down to the legitimacy of the state, the leadership that there is. Why is Botswana a success and Zimbabwe a failure? They're both you know, neighboring countries, resource rich. One had great leadership, one had terrible leadership. So in the end, this is the optimistic note, is these things are fixable. They're fixable with leadership that can bring forward the sense that in every country, there are sacrifices you have to make in the present in order to build a stronger future. And to do that, you've got to trust your fellow citizens and you've also got to trust your government. And if you do that, then you can have a stable city and not a fragile one. And I think to answer your question, that you can have a stable country with fragile cities. I think we saw that actually in Western countries not that long ago when we had some very unstable and rather fragile and not very secure cities. But I think it's very hard to think of a stable city in a fragile country. And so therefore, the emphasis on trying to build stability at the state level, mm -hmm. at the leadership level, at the capacity level, as someone put it, I think is probably the key. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Basima Abdurrahman. Um, so I will not talk about fragile government or uh, building trust between government and people because everybody knows how complicated the situation in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not a politician, although living and all of my life in Iraq should make me a very professional one. Uh, so I'm, I'm going, to, going to talk about from an engineering perspective mm -hmm. and uh, how things are going to make my life easier. Um, if we talk about the future, we need to make sure the government will be the key uh, uh, leader, the stakeholder in this. But we, we need to have all stakeholders from private sector, from uh, civil society, uh, individuals, all involved. So it's important to start with accurate data, clear national strategy, and matching long-term commitments by the government, directing all stakeholders, um, using lessons learned, for example, from uh, uh, Switzerland, and, and incorporating mu uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, consultation concept while, while planning and designing, and making sure it's flexible. So as uh, by using Mr. Singh's uh, phrase, what's sustainable now might, might not be sustainable in the future. We need to make sure that the design is flexible, is, is, is able to incorporate uh, future needs, future technologies. What's, what's being uh, developed 15 years ago should have taken into consideration that we're going to have uh, shared bikes, uh, uh, zip cars, and, and all these new, you know, um, uh, uh, a new things that has been introduced to the society. So this is in terms of the, if we're talking about the future and, and, and the planning. But for now, I agree with uh, Mr. Cameron. International donors, it, it's very important for them to, to, to take into consideration that whatever money they're, they're, they're putting uh, into assisting Iraq or Syria or any of the, these fragile countries, to make sure that they have the obligation or like a list of obligations that this money is spent to make sure that people are resilient and, 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 and cities are sustainable. So this way the money is not spent to be um, used for like a one-time thing. 
uh, uh, there is a huge amount of money being spent now. So this is like a, a building on what Mr. Cameron was saying. It's it's very, very <coughs> important point. So Thank that's for the current much. moment. Thank Thanks. you. President Bercy. Well, maybe my last uh, last point will be related with culture. We don't uh, we didn't speak about culture and the uh, importance of culture in the building, mm -hmm. how we build. Mm -hmm. We spoke about infrastructure, but uh, an infrastructure can have a really big influence uh, on how we live in cities. For example, to to uh, to make a house, to make a road, to make a place with a high quality will not have the same consequences as if you make that own it without to, to, to think about the quality. And uh, I think there is a lack um, um, uh, of policies in that, in that sense. And uh, uh, we, uh, we had uh, at the beginning of this week here in Davos, 18 uh, culture minister of a member state of the Council of Europe uh, in order to exchange about that. And we adopted the declaration of, of Davos for the high quality in the uh, built environment in the Bau Kultur. It's quite difficult to define in, in, in English. And I think it is a concern not only for us, but it's a concern for all countries in the world. And I think we need to uh, improve, to do more in that sense, to improve the quality in the, in the built environment. Thank you very much. There's, an, there's a surprising theme that we're ending on here, um, which is that issues like culture and sustainability go to the question of who we are as a community for any community. Expressions of culture help cement, this is who we are, this is our identity. We are a culture that celebrates this. Sustainability is a way for a culture to recognize that it cares about its children, it cares about its grandchildren. We're a community that, that cares. And that we've talked about a new kind of leadership on this panel, a leadership which is more attentive to local inclusion, that's more attentive to the innovation and creativity of local communities, that crafts a narrative, in David Cameron's words, but it's a narrative that's gonna have to be one that the local community recognizes as theirs. So can I thank you all for a very illuminating discussion of fragile cities. <laughs> <laughs>